Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It really is the affliction which most of us, really all of us to some degree, suffer from. Not really believing this message of change that takes place with the incarnation and the resurrection of Christ. We are indeed able to change. We have to give our lives completely over to Christ without exception, without any detail. And in doing that, we show forth our trust for Him. Him saying that this kind of demon only comes out by prayer and fasting gives us two examples of things we must do to open our hearts up to that type of belief. When we deny ourselves but trust in God. We deny ourselves food, we trust that God can make things right, that our body is not the ultimate God, that we must turn our hearts over to prayer, that the soul should dominate. When we turn ourselves over to prayer, we are, of course, turning ourselves over to speaking to the one true God, personally, who can help us. But this prayer, this type of demon, these types of passions that we have, only come out with these two methods. As Metropolitan Philaret of thrice blessed memory from the Russian Church Abroad said that... It was like casting a rock up into the sky, and the rock would go up as far as you could throw it, as much impetus as you put behind it. But once it lost that impetus, it would come crashing back down to the earth. He meant that in the same way as our spiritual life. When we stop putting force behind it, we crash back down to the earth. So as St. Seraphim was wont to say over and over, that the violent take the kingdom by force, we must force our weak natures, we must force our laziness to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is not that we achieve anything. It is not that it is not without God's grace. It's completely God's grace. But God wants to see that we want Him. He won't force Himself upon us. He gives us the opportunity to deny ourselves, to put Him first in our lives. To pray without fasting, prayer is good, but you're missing a wing. To fast without prayer is nothing but a diet. Many people do that. But it's really ultimately spiritually meaningless at that point. But when you have both of them, we have two wings, which we can be like the angels to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It requires both of those things and great effort to do so. It is not by accident, of course, that this, of course, falls during the Feast of the Mother of God, her Annunciation, better said, as I said yesterday, Evangelismos, the evangelization of the Virgin, the proclaiming forth of the Gospel to the Virgin, means far more than an announcement, much more powerful than an announcement. So maybe the Greek is better there, certainly it is better. And the Russian is the same, Lagoviest. God, I bring forth a blessing, the gospel is being brought forth. But she is an example of that. She dedicated her life from the youngest age to prayer, to giving herself over to the temple to prayer, and very meager food which the angel Gabriel brought to her from the youngest age, and devoted her whole life unto her son in prayer, and proclaiming forth the gospel by her meekness and silence of life. She bore these things within her heart, as we are told, and everyone looked up to her. St. John Climacus, who we also celebrate today, but gets put aside because of the Annunciation, I'm sure would not be mine being put aside because he was so profoundly humble. He must be mentioned today because he is an exemplar of prayer and fasting, what it means to live the gospel life. St. John, as a young man at 16, went to the monastery and was not long after professed as a monk. And his elder, Martyrios, taking him around to the different elders, takes him over to Anastasios, and Anastasios says, You have professed the abbot of Sinai. He's a 16-year-old child at this point, boy. Later he takes him to another one of the elders, going to blank. John the Savite. Took him to John the Savite, and John the Savite gets down, doesn't wash Martyrios' feet, but washes the young John's feet. Abba Martyrios says, Abba John, what are you doing? He says, I am washing the feet of the abbot of Sinai. I don't know why, but he is the abbot of Sinai. Later on, he takes him to Abba Strategios, and Abba Strategios looks at him and says, This one will be a great luminary, a great light for the church. How can a young man bear all this without the most profound humility? He lived the monastic life exemplary, in an exemplary fashion in the monastery for about three or four years, 
And he went to live in the cave, which you can still see on Sinai, a very austere place, where he lived for 40 years. 40 years of austerity, not giving up, not 40 days of fasting, not a couple of days of difficult fasting during Holy Week, but 40 years in which he would come down to the monastery, of course, on the weekends for the feast and for the Eucharist. Eventually, they ask Abba John to be the abbot of Sinai. And he comes down. They want him to instruct, but of course, as people are want to do, they don't like his instruction. They complain about Abba John. And so he says he talks too much. He thinks he knows too much. Abba John, not taking offense, went back to his cave and didn't speak for a year. Not out of contempt, not out of some passive aggressive fashion, but because he truly was that humble. By the end of this year, of course, they were begging him to come back out of his cave because they needed his teaching to survive the spiritual life. And eventually he was asked, of course, to write a book, to write down his thoughts on the spiritual life because he had such great experience. And he gave us what has become this great monument of the church, the Ladder of Divine Ascent, what his name means, Klimakos, is a ladder. And St. John, of course, portrayed it in 30 steps, most of which, the vast majority, deal with the passions, the last few dealing with faith, hope, and love, and the virtues. But as Abba Piman says, how can we talk about the kingdom of heaven when we are immersed in the passions, what got us out of the kingdom of heaven? So this is not really a how-to book. It is a book where he gives observations about what brings on the passions, what the effects of the passions are, what their daughters are and brothers, as he will put it. It gives some hints of how to deal with them, and also the virtues, what they look like. He won't talk about humility, because he says for a man who's a sinner to talk about humility is like a man trying to swim in a sea in his clothes, so I don't deign to talk about the higher theology. He has wonderful phrases. He mentions that a thief is sometimes turned back by a dog out of fear, but we are not turned back by the presence of God in every time and every place. He gives wonderful advice occasionally, like he says, to not have respect for human persons when they are slandering someone. This is an example we can all really use. When we hear someone talking badly about their brother, Abba John says to look at them and say, bluntly, brother, stop it. I do worse things every single day, and I dare criticize him. He says, in doing so, we heal two people with one band-aid the one who was slandering, and yourself from hearing it. Beautiful advice, because we cannot attain to humility. We are busy talking about others. Of course, he speaks much about fasting, talking of that, you know, that mistress that is seductive, that tempts us, we need the food, but yet we use it far more in abundance than we need to. Of course, in this country, I can say that more than any country in the world, we are a, a land of plenty a land of fat, a land of eating way too much compared to what the vast majority of the universe is eating and certainly that our forebears ate. And it shows not only in our physical beings and the health issues we have, but in our spiritual lives because we are tied down too much to comfort, unlike the Theotokos and unlike Abba John. He speaks much about prayer too. Of course, that wonderful line, there are we to whip or flog the demons with the name of Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful line for us to remember. Now, in most monasteries in the world, not in all, but most monasteries, this is the common table reading during every Lent. And many read it outside of Lent. So there are some, you know, I've been told, they can quote not only the scriptures, they can quote the latter line and verse as well. It is that important a spiritual text. He gives us these tremendous stories, which are monuments throughout history, of St. Akakios, that model of obedience that I've mentioned before, of Abakiros, who bore with derision, of Ezekios the Horevite, who saw death and remembered it and remembered the silence because of that and never sinned again, as it is said. He gave us that example of the prison, of these monks who had lost that presence of the uncreated light and would do virtually anything in almost shocking fashion to win back that grace of God. He gives us great examples which are to do what? Not only to humble us, 
but to inspire us to push ourselves even farther, to be true disciples of Christ, because indeed the time is short, and as St. Peter says in his second epistle, we must be diligent to make our call and election sure, to work on that because we do not know when our time is. And the only way we get rid of these burdens in our life is not by YouTube, is not by Facebook, is not by Twitter, is not by the television, is not by the radio, it is not by endless distraction, it's certainly not by overeating, it is by prayer and fasting to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That is where true joy comes, because we no longer become dependent upon the world, become dependent upon God, and God fills us up with himself. The fasting is so important that St. Seraphim was asked one time by a person who her daughter should marry, and he said, you make sure that the man keeps the fasts. She looks at him and he goes, he who does not keep the fast is not a Christian. This is St. Seraphim, who we all love. The canons actually prescribe, if one breaks the fast, that they are to be excommunicated for a time, and a priest is to be suspended. That's how serious the church felt about these things, not in a legalistic fashion, because it realized that these things, revealed by the Holy Spirit, are tools which open our hearts to the kingdom of God, which the Holy Spirit revealed to us. So it is essential it is not an option to the best of our ability to keep the fast. And when we look at our fast compared to the people like St. John and the great saints, we can't even touch them. They kept them in ways that were full of grace. They were not dependent upon the ways of this world. They were dependent sheerly on the Word of God and the love of the Savior. We must push ourselves. We must push ourselves to be more than Sunday Christians, because I heard an Antiochian priest saying recently, Sunday Christianity is not Christianity. It's a Protestant construct which no saint in the history of the Church has kept to. There's no saint in the history of Orthodoxy who only went to Church on Sundays. It doesn't exist. So if we want to enter the Kingdom of Heaven, we must not model ourselves after the lowest common denominator, we model ourselves after the saints, model ourselves after Christ, to be Christ-like, to be holy for He is holy, and to follow that example of people like Abba John and the Most Holy Theotokos who truly could say, may it be unto me according to thy word, as I said yesterday in my homily, not like us, who as the Greek bishop said, it's, we don't have the, he said we have insufficient funds to make that statement in our bank account, to pay it. We will get an overdraft. She could say it because she had the virtues to say it. So we must cultivate those same virtues that she had. Of humility, of meekness, of love, of prayer and fasting. To turn ourselves completely over to Christ, that we too, from now, in the second, might be able to say, may it be unto me according to thy word, and truly become Christians, people who were worthy of that name, who took everything they owned and laid it at the feet of the apostles, not just the money, but their entire lives and their ways of thought. St. John prayed to God for us. 